Welcome to everyone who's filing in to today's event. Uh, this is the Journal of the Civil War Era's webinar. Today we are hosting Professor Kenneth No, and um, he's going to be talking about his book, his recent book, which I'm going to turn it over later to Greg Downs to introduce. So my job right now is to just say a few things about our event series before uh, we get really into today's event. So this uh, today's webinar is part of a series that the Journal of the Civil War Era has been doing with historians. We started uh, early last summer and just partly out of a desire to meet the moment of the pandemic by contributing talks with historians, mostly about new books and to help create some of the intellectual climate that a lot of us have been missing out on as we've been separated during the, uh, during the pandemic. And, um, today's event is our third to last of this academic year. So I want to just mention what we're going to be doing next so you can have it on your calendars. Um, the two remaining events we have after today are first on April 14th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be hosting Elena Roberts and she'll be speaking about her book, I've Been Here All the While, Black Freedom on Native Land. And then our last talk of this school year is going to be on May 12th at 4 p.m. Eastern with Kevin Waite, and he'll be discussing his book, West of Slavery, The Southern Dream of a Transcontinental Empire. Now, all of the recordings of these talks are up on the journal's YouTube page, which is relatively new, so you'll be able to find all of our previous talks and this one and the other ones later on on the YouTube channel. The way we're gonna do it is, uh, Greg Downs will introduce our speaker today and we'll ask him some questions and then uh, eventually we'll transition into questions from you who are here with us. So you should be able to see on the lower sort of right hand side of your screen of your zoom screen, a Q&A button that's where you can put your questions that you might have for our author today. You can put questions there anytime during the talk, um, or as we transition into the post talk questions and answers and we will um, filter through those and ask those and do the best we can to get to as many as we can before we wrap up around an hour from now. So uh, without further ado, Greg Downs. All right, I'm really delighted to join Kate in uh, welcoming you and to give our thanks, as uh, we surely will at the end again, uh, to Matt Isham and uh, to uh, Cecily Zander for their work in making possible all of the, uh, the work that we'll be doing today. And uh, they're behind the scenes keeping things going. If you have any technological issues, uh, you can either text us or them through the chat. You'll also see on the chat that Cecily has posted um, different links to uh, our past and upcoming webinars. Um, and again, as Kate said, the Q&A function um, is the, we'll be keeping our eye on that throughout. So it is our special pleasure today to welcome Ken No, uh, who I get the uh, distinct pleasure of introducing and posing the first question to. Then Kate and I will uh, ask questions for a while. We'll keep our eye on the Q&A function and start to meld those questions in over the course of the hour. Ken No received his PhD from the University of Illinois, where he studied with the, under the late Robert Johansson. And since 2000, he has been the drawn professor of Southern history at Auburn University, where he teaches courses on topics, including the American Civil War, Civil War memory and Appalachia. He's the author, author of a number of books, including most recently the book that'll be our subject of discussion uh, today, The Howland Storm, Weather, Climate and the American Civil War, uh, which was named a finalist for the Lincoln Prize. So we're really delighted to have you join us today. And I wonder if we can just start off with a general question uh, for those of our viewers who haven't yet had the pleasure of reading the book. If you can uh, just give a quick overview of what the book is about, and then we'll dive into some of the really interesting topics you raise. Sure. Well, first I wanna say thanks for inviting me. Uh, thanks to everyone involved. And thanks for those of you out there watching today. I think we're almost exactly a year into the Zoom era. And if you're not suffering from Zoom fatigue already, um, thanks for being here today. I much appreciate it. Um, the book is, in its essence, a retelling of the military and, to an extent, the home front history of the Civil War, really from Fort Sumter to beyond Appomattox, but exploring the war in a different way. When I was a kid growing up in Virginia, 
we were taught that the war was a contest between the blue and the gray. And what I argue in the book is that we should think about it in an environmental context, uh, almost as a war between the blue, the gray, and the weather. I think weather was an important factor in this war. I think it had a sense of agency. It didn't have intention or a brain, but weather was in many ways as important as an opposing army. And it was, in a sense, a non-aligned power that the Confederates expected to become an ally, but in fact, largely supported the Union cause during the war. So what I do, because I was really interested in change over time and how soldiers and commanders learned lessons as the war went along, is I started Fort Sumter uh, with not only the bombardment we all know about, but that huge nor'easter that came in the first night, a storm that was powerful enough to actually stop the bombardment for a while. And I go all the way through um, to Appomattox, that rainy week leading up to the surrender, and a bit beyond um, sort of looking ahead toward reconstruction. That's great. And I wonder in terms of uh, helping to frame for um, <clears throat> those viewers who aren't familiar, if you can walk them through the crucial differences uh, that you articulate in the beginning of the book between climate and weather and how that helps you uh, integrate uh, environmental and military history in really provocative ways. Sure, sure. I think it was Mark Twain who said the difference between climate and weather is that weather is something that happens every day, but climate happens all the time. If we take all of our individual weather readings in a certain place day after day after day, and you put them together, that's climate, that's the norm. But as we all know, uh, weather on any particular day can vary from the norm, it can be hotter, colder, rainier. Uh, here in Alabama right now, we're under a tornado watch, that's not the norm although we live in a climate where those things are possible. So there are various ways to understand American climate. I took a really simple one because I'm not a trained meteorologist, I'm a historian. Um, the federal government actually divides the United States into seven separate climate zones, uh, largely based on how much it takes to heat a home to a certain temperature during the winter. And those are pretty standard. But weather was that day by day happenstance event that soldiers had to deal with, civilians had to deal with through the war as well. And I get at that in various ways. Uh, the Smithsonian Institution actually had created a system in the mid 1840s in an attempt to gather weather, weather data from around the country. That system largely fell apart in the Confederacy during the war, but not completely. Uh, the military was taking daily temperature readings. Uh, soldiers were writing largely qualitatively, but sometimes quantitatively about whether there are newspaper accounts, there are other accounts. I tried to put all those together to get a sense of what day by day weather looked like in that broader context of a deep south climate or an upper south climate. So, yeah, can I, I would just like to follow up on, on um, you said, you know, I'm not a trained meteorologist, and of course you're not, probably most of the people who are here with us today are not. And so, um, one thing that struck me, in certain places in the book, you talk about kind of large scale, I don't know if it's accurate to say, they, events that combine weather and climate, things like El Nino and these right. kind of large weather patterns um, that affected the Civil War, whether people at the time were aware or not that this was part of a large pattern. And I, I wonder um, if you could talk a little bit about your experiences as a historian, sort of moving closer to these fields of um, the history, environment and, and, uh, and weather as it's studied by people whose focus is that area. In other words, what did you do to um, educate yourself? Did you talk to people? Did you read books that were completely outside of this field? How did you gather enough of a sense of expertise in those areas that you felt um, you know, comfortable writing about it? In a way, it was like going back to grad school. I mean, it really was. I had to learn a lot that I did not know. Uh, I think when I was an undergraduate, I took a geography class that had some basic weather 
understanding in it, but certainly that didn't prepare me to write this book. So I met people, I talked to people. I talked to people like Carrie Mock at the University of South Carolina, who is creating this huge uh, project um, based on collecting weather data from across North America and Europe as well. Uh, I talked to uh, professors here at Auburn who deal with soil mechanics because it really became apparent to me that a book about weather was also going to be a book about mud or dust. Uh, I read as much as I could uh, and it was, it was often exciting and often frustrating because I wrote this book in a period when conventional wisdom about what was happening in terms of weather and climate in the Civil War era was actually changing and changed a couple of times. Um, when I first started the project, there was a general consensus that the Civil War years, at least some of the Civil War years, were mildly El Nino years. And then we went into a period where other meteorologists and other scientists said, no, they were probably not La Nina years. And then we swung back around, back to El Nino, uh, leaving me writing something in the book to say, hey, this might change again, I'm not an expert. But we seem to be having El Nino years. Um, December 6, well, 1861 was probably a La Nina year. There seems to be some agreement on that. Um, beginning around first and of December. And just for people who are not totally up on their climate science, can you just say like, so what was a La Nina year as opposed oh, to sure. El Nino year? Yeah, yeah just yeah, to sure. kind of. The best descriptions that I've seen um, describe something like a conveyor belt or a seesaw in the Pacific with the coast of Peru and Ecuador and the east and the islands of Indonesia on the west. And usually the currents and air currents flow in a certain direction. They generally flow east to west, uh, which leaves very cold water off of South America and much warmer water uh, in Indonesia. That's, that's a normal year. La Nina is sometimes described as extreme normal. You have that only more so. And that has effects um, throughout the basin. So for example, in a La Nina year, you would expect the American South to be relatively dry and relatively hot, as it was uh, in Missouri during the Wilson's Creek campaign in 1861. For reasons that no one really quite understands, uh, sometimes that system breaks down and the conveyor belt starts running the other way. Warmer water starts flowing west to east. Um, the temperature of water off Peru, Ecuador might go up four or five degrees, but that's enough to go aloft into the air. Air becomes warmer, uh, more moist, um, jet stream changes, weather patterns change in North America and around the world. Uh, so you're, you're more likely to get um, very wet winters in the South, as well as the, the sorts of things that we see uh, all the time uh, on the news about California in terms of mudslides and the like. So those patterns are happening clearly during the American Civil War. But on top of that, there's another phenomenon called the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is sort of like El Nino operating in the Atlantic from a permanent low pressure system around Iceland to a permanent high pressure system around the Azores. And sometimes the difference in barometric pressure between those two pressure systems change. So when they get closer together, when the barometric pressures become more alike, uh, that's called a negative North Atlantic oscillation. That affects weather in America too. That brings cold weather and heavy snow to New England, the Middle Atlantic states in the South. It also brings a lot of cold and snow to Western Europe. Uh, the Battle of Bul the Bulge was fought in a negative North Atlantic oscillation year. 1862, 1864, and 1865 seem to be negative North Atlantic oscillation years. So what's happening on the ground in the South during the American Civil War is that at various times you have both El Nino, or the larger El Nino Southern Oscillation System, La Nina plus El Nino. You've got that operating. And then you've got the North Atlantic Oscillation operating in a different way. And the combination of those two meant that 
Civil War weather was really very unusual. In fact, usually when I talk to groups, I just say it was weird. And it was, uh, you know, I'm not sure there is a normal weather year now. I've, I've gotten away from thinking that there is something called normality. But those were very unusual years. And they had dramatic effects, not only on campaigns and battles, but also on farming, on food production, um, which I think to me, in some ways, that's the most important and interesting part of the book. I mean, there's a lot in here about military history. There's a lot in here about uh, the Potomac flooding after the Battle of Gettysburg, but there's also a lot in the book about uh, heavy rains during spring planting and drought that uh, I think really limited Confederate food supply and was a foundational issue for all of those things we talk about as internal problems within the Confederacy, the tax and kind, and, and all the things that seem to tear the Confederacy apart from within start with a lack of food supply. Um, caused by these climactic and more individual weather conditions. One of the really fun parts of your book is the movement from the, you know, literally, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, in the, in the air, uh, the extremely high level vision of a world uh, changing, uh, you know, at the, at the level of climate to on the ground in the ways that that framework allows you um, to recast some moments that might be that people might think they know and to capture an unfamiliar parts of that. And I wonder if it would be, uh, if we could get you to talk about one or two places where you think uh, would help people see uh, how thinking in this way about the climate and this form of environmental history can defamiliarize something they think they, they understand. Sure, there are moments where I confronted conventional wisdom with some surprise. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I'll sit at the keyboard just think, I can't believe I'm writing this, but I think this is true. Uh, a perfect example of that, I suppose, would be McClellan's Peninsula campaign. I mean, for 150 years, we've been saying, what about McClellan? He was petulant, he was timid, he was afraid to advance, he didn't want to uh, use up his army, et cetera, et cetera. And so he hesitantly moved up the peninsula and failed to take Richmond. I don't think that's the case at all. I'm, I've, I've hardly become a McClellan booster, but I'm a lot more favorable to him. Now that I understand the weather conditions that confronted him on the peninsula during that campaign in 1862. It was very rainy, not so much in terms of volume, but in terms of frequency. It rained a lot. It really did rain more or less every other day. He's moving an army in those conditions through a particularly porous kind of southern red clay, which one finds near the coast, which created incredible mud. Um, Northern soldiers coming south had largely not encountered uh, red clay before, altasol, if you want to use the technical term. And what shocked them about it was that they had trouble finding a solid level as they marched along. If you're moving through most parts of the North, for example, if your wagon becomes bogged down in mud, eventually it reaches a solid level. You can pull it out, you can dig it out. That doesn't happen with red clay. So all these stories about wagons being buried or, or horses being buried up to their necks and mules up to their ears, which I thought was apocryphal at first. And I've come to conclude that's real. Another factor there is that McClellan throughout the campaign is pursuing Johnston's army up to Richmond, which means the Confederates are going through and chewing it up first. And then the Federals are coming along and making it even worse. So there literally are days when McClellan's army is bogged down. You've also got intense flooding, um, the necessary bridge building that often follows, but then the bridges wash away. You're trying to do that with cavalry, artillery, siege guns at one point. Moving up to Richmond was incredibly difficult. And I don't think we give McClellan 
or his men credit for what they actually accomplished. This notion that, oh, they could have taken Richmond. I don't think that's true at all. And a lot of the men who fought with McClellan in 1862 and then later served under Grant in 1864 in the same area said the same thing, pointing out that it took Grant even a lot longer to get up to Richmond and the weather wasn't as bad. So that's one of those areas where I think we just sort of flip military history over on its ear because I had to rethink George McClellan. Uh, another example, I guess, would be the retreat from Gettysburg. Uh, again, where starting, I think, with Abraham Lincoln and up to the present day, many people like to really criticize Meade for not trapping Lee north of the Potomac, especially given that the Potomac was flooded. I mean, it rained pretty much every day uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg for the next two and a half weeks. But I think that's unfair as well. Uh, McClellan, uh, pardon me, Meade, mixing up the two, that said, you know, Meade made a reasonable choice to take a different path to the Potomac, uh, to move down uh, the pike toward Maryland and then cross west over the mountains to try to get it late, which would have made perfect sense had it not been for this tremendous rain. And for the fact that there is a tiny little finger of Southern red clay, of Ultisol, that pokes up from Virginia and Maryland and quite literally runs into Little Round Top. So as Meade's army tries to move south and they run into the normal traffic jams, Teamsters and gunners and other people, you know, do what we see people do on the interstate all the time. They, they go off the road and try to go on the side and they start bogging down in that red clay. They actually make pretty good progress the first day, but by then they've worn out their horses. There are two corps in Meade's army that cannot get their horses across the Appalachians um, for a final confrontation with Lee. Once you look at the weather conditions, uh, and it's easy to understand the weather conditions because there's a Smithsonian observer in Gettysburg, um, the sort of guy who was literally out at two o'clock on July 1st, 1863, taking weather observations while the two armies were fighting past his house. I've been to his house. Um, so we've got the records and we know that the weather was terrible and it really did slow down Meade. And I don't think the president was fair to him at that moment. I don't think we've been fair to him since. Um, those were two moments that I think were exceptional yeah. in the case that that's when weather decided to help the Confederates out. Thank you so much. I hope that I'm coming through. You are. I just, okay, I, your internet is unstable message. Um, okay, so those are such great examples and I hope we can come back to this question of which side the weather ultimately was on. Um, and I also wanna remind people uh, to please go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A um, so we can start lining up questions from you all and um, start asking those. I was really struck by the impact of the weather, not surprisingly in some ways on the lives of soldiers, um, whether it was winter or summer or, or whatever. I mean, you know, you describe, first of all, you draw very heavily on letters by soldiers who are experiencing this. They're freezing, they're wet, their clothes are wet and frozen at the same time. Um, in the summer, they're having heat stroke. They're like passing out from the heat and they're blinded. And they, I mean, some of them die from these, from the weather conditions alone, not to mention the diseases that are kind of propagated in unhealthy wet weather. Um, and so I guess I'm, I would love to hear you talk a little bit, especially for the people who are here about the things that people tried to do, that soldiers tried to do to protect themselves. I mean, certain kinds of technologies, you know, you talk about their clothing or their tents or stoves, but what were some of the things that you learned about, about the ways that people involved in this tried to deal with the situation? I think the first thing I learned goes back to something you just said. Civil War soldiers died in a myriad of weather-related ways. And you can certainly count illness there. But, you know, they drowned, they froze to death. Uh, they were in their tents when trees fell on them during storms, they burned to death. Um, 
it was a dangerous environment in so many ways. And so they tried to cope with that in various ways. Uh, they tried to get rain gear, for example. At the beginning of the war, rubber ponchos were available. They were not issued, but they were available for private purchase. And a lot of Union soldiers started acquiring ponchos, uh, either back home or from sutlers in the field until they're finally issued. Uh, Confederate soldiers would do anything to get those ponchos. Uh, we, we know about these incidents where Confederates overrun federal camps and, and the pursuit breaks down because you know, we hear they're looting, they're, they're stealing things. Well, they're often taking tents and ponchos and rain gear, the sorts of things that uh, their own government cannot supply. By the winter of 1863, 1864, a, a large percentage of the Army of Northern Virginia is sleeping under Union issued tents. So you've got that. You've got experimentation in tenting as well. Uh, tents at the beginning of the war tend to be hauled by wagons. They're heavy. Wagons get bogged down. Wagons don't make it up. Men are going without shelter. And so really beginning with George McClellan in the East, and then it spreads slowly to the West, uh, we begin to see the, the shelter half, the, the, the grandfather of the modern pup tent, which soldiers hated, but at least they could carry it with them, which meant they always, was, always would have some shelter. In the winter, uh, the situation I think is even more interesting. Uh, sometimes generals would go into winter quarters, sometimes they would not, sometimes they would unofficially go into winter quarters because to announce that you were doing that might be a political problem back in the capital. But throughout all of this, men were desperately trying to find ways to stay warm in the winter. And it's just fascinating to me to see how they experimented. From the beginning, um, Union armies and Confederate armies were, were sheltering themselves differently. Confederates leaned toward cabins. Uh, for various reasons, uh, the Army of the Potomac will try to stay under canvas until that becomes difficult. And then they start creating these sort of hybrid shelters uh, made out of both logs and canvas with a roof or the upper part being made out of their tents. And they, they experiment with this every winter. And sometimes the brass gets involved. Um, Charles Tripler, who was at one point McClellan's uh, medical director, actually sets up model camps and he says things like, stop digging basements, stop digging in the ground. You can't stay dry, you'll get sicker. Uh, there are experiments with various kinds of, of heating. We assume that these guys were just building fireplaces, but in some cases they're building really sophisticated heating systems under these cabins or tents. They are doing everything they can to stay warm or dry. It's not always very uh, successful, but it's, it's really interesting to see the innovation that is taking place. And I'm not the first to say this, but in a way, it's a vernacular architecture that we really haven't studied very much. But I think it's fascinating, even down to those poor guys on pickets who were, were trying to build shelters out of corn stalks because it was better than nothing. And they, they cope in all sorts of other ways. Um, Catherine Shively has written about this uh, I mean, in a much better sense than me, but it affects their behavior. It affects uh, the decision to stay with the line of march or maybe drop out and find a warm place to sleep for the night. Uh, it's a constant learning process. And again, one of the reasons that I wanted to do the book chronologically, one of the reasons that the book is so big is that I wanted to understand that learning process. I wanted to see how they adapted over time. Uh, for me, soldiers who were going through really bad weather conditions, say in the Mill Springs campaign in Kentucky, early in 1862, some of those same soldiers are with Sherman when he marches across South Carolina. And to see how they have learned, to see how they've adapted uh, in terms of just automatically corduroying roads or or accepting that they can only take certain things or um, getting used to marching without boots, that sort of thing. The, the learning process, I think, is really an important part of the story. Thanks so much. We've got some uh, really interesting questions coming in over the Q&A and, &A, right. and I'll, I'll pose one of those and just encourage others to uh, to keep uh, keep filling them in. Uh, this one came from Robert May. He asked, uh, most of the war environmental history from his impression hones in on environmental impacts on ground campaigns. 
Um, and, uh, and you've mentioned, you know, some crucial ground campaigns today. Is there a naval environmental history of the Civil War waiting to be written? Or is it already out there? And if not, what do you think would a environmental history of the naval campaigns would look like? I think it absolutely needs to be written. I mean, one of the things I say in the introduction, Mr. May, I mean, it's a big book. I mean, I've joked about this before. It's a, it's a big book. And heaven forgive me, the original draft was 300 pages longer. So, I mean, it was a two volume book at one point. So I know what's in it, but I also know the things that I could not cover. And the Naval War is one of those that I just, I didn't have space to deal with adequately. But I think it's really, really fascinating, both in terms of men who were on ships, first of all, and but also those soldiers who were manning those coastal fortifications up and down the coast from Maine to Texas. And I actually did collect some interesting um, observations from men in those fortifications about what it was like. Their war was a war of dealing with very harsh weather, with wind, with storm, with heat, um, gale force winds, uh, occasionally hurricanes, three hurricanes during the American Civil War. Um, I mentioned Kerry Mock earlier in South Carolina. Kerry Mock and his uh, research partner, Mike Chenoweth, discovered a hurricane that we had forgotten about. There were no real newspaper accounts of a hurricane that struck around Appalachicola in the summer of 1863. And it didn't have a name. They weren't naming hurricanes then. Um, so um, they named it Hurricane Amanda because it sank the USS Amanda off of Appalachicola. Those are the sorts of things that men are dealing with in the Naval War. Occasionally, I, I, I do get into, I guess I should say that, occasionally I get into uh, the transfer of troops to the Texas coast, for example, which took place during some really bad weather, um, terrible gale force winds. Um, but that needs to be written. There's so much that I hope the book opens the door to. I hope I encourage people. I hope I've, I've primed the pump for people to look at the environment and the naval war, the environment and guerrilla war, which is something I wrote about early in my career, but really didn't get to in this book. I think more needs to be done on the home front. Uh, I think there's a really important story to be written about emancipation in the Southern environment. Um, you know, we know that distance played a role when people were able to escape farms and plantations, but I rather suspect that weather did too. I'm thinking about Amy Taylor's work on a refugee camp up in Kentucky. Um, I think there's so much we can do by taking the war back outside, which I will confess, first time I ever said that, it was supposed to be a joke and no one laughed, just like no one's laughing now. Um, but I've come to think that's a serious, a serious idea that we, we've tended to assume the war took place in some sort of climate controlled environment. Once we break out of that envelope, I think there are all sorts of opportunities available to us. Um, you know, I'm thinking about a uh, description I once read of, of Harriet Tubman fleeing slavery through the sweet gum forests of the Delmarva Peninsula. We have sweet gums out in the front yard. They're incredibly painful when you step on them. Uh, running away with Harriet Tubman to freedom uh, was a painful process on one's feet. We don't think about that, but that's that's an environmental way to understand emancipation. So absolutely, I, I, I hope people follow. And some people are following along. I, I, I know some folks who, for example, are looking at uh, the environment and prisoner of war camps. Um, prisoner and of war camps. Really Oh, Go ahead, Kate, I'm sorry. No, uh, so, but I mean, I wanted to just affirm that you really capture that, the, as you just said, taking it outdoors um, in ways that were really interesting to me, right? That all, if we're more familiar with thinking about battles and, and kind of how these things unfolded without so much emphasis on the fact that they were outdoors and what that really meant and what that felt like to people who were living through it. As you say, you know, the weather as a third kind of uh, combatant in this, in this conflict, um, you really 
you, you really begin to think about it uh, differently. And as you said, um, part of that rethinking involves rethinking certain uh, very well-known episodes of the Civil War and thinking about them differently, not to mention the lives of uh, the people involved. One question, um, just with your uh, discussion of her, your brief discussion of hurricanes brought to mind a question from one of our attendees who wanted to know about extreme weather also. Um, did the soldiers encounter any tornadoes or something described as destructive as a tornado? Were there any moments of, you know, that kind of very extreme weather that, that uh, folks were contending with? Absolutely, I've, I've, I've charted at least five tornadoes in the Eastern theater. I imagine there were more in the West. They're just, I wasn't able to find accounts of them, but it's pretty clear that they occurred. Um, and the descriptions certainly match exactly with what I hope doesn't happen in my backyard tonight in terms of swirling winds and debris abo aloft and the whole thing. And people were killed in tornadoes. People were killed in storms. Absolutely. One other question that came in on the Q&A um, was about drinking water. And you do talk about, you know, the questions about whether we should see it as part of an extended drought. Um, and even in non-drought times, uh, the question of, of maintaining supplies and sources of water uh, and the impact of dehydration on, uh, on soldiers and on battles, uh, you know, is a pressing question. So I wonder if you've got some thoughts you'd share on the sort of water problem. Well, I do. Sometimes I do. There's too much coming down from the sky, but other times there's not enough to go in their bodies, right? Other times there's not enough. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking about this earlier. I think at least the professional origins of this book go back over 20 years when I wrote another book about the Battle of Perryville. The Battle of Perryville, the Kentucky campaign as a whole, took place in a drought. That was the first time I understood there had been this massive drought in 1862. <laughs> So I wrote about the campaign. I wrote about how um, the lack of water and food affected individuals and affected operational planning. Braxton Bragg at one point changes his line of march because he's trying to find his men something to eat. The battle itself begins as a fight over some springs of water uh, in an area that has otherwise gone dry. I look back on that book when I was writing my Perryville chapter for Hal and Storm, and I realized that there were things that I had missed that I wish I had thought about more 20 years ago. And one of those was exactly that, that notion of dehydration and bad water. Because you've got these armies moving up, in some cases from Alabama, um, but certainly through Tennessee into Kentucky in a drought. There's not a lot of water for either Buell's army or Bragg's army. So they really are drinking anything they can find. Um, which in some cases includes ponds that are covered with green scum. In some cases, it includes water courses uh, that are full of dead horses and mules. Um, and I don't think there's any question now in my mind that the army that fought at Perryville was sick. A lot of them were dehydrated. A lot of them had diarrhea. And as we know, chronic diarrhea was in many ways the great killer of the American Civil War. It's not a fun project to write a book about, but it's true. Uh, I think the extreme death toll after Perryville, in the sense that men were starting to recover from their wounds and then a few days later they got sick again and the death toll again jumped up. I think it has to do with those, at least in part, with those environmental concerns of drinking bad water for weeks and weeks covered with, you know, coupled with a lack of food and other issues. Um, you know, I think too, the Wilson's Creek campaign going back to 1861, where the, the Federals and the Confederates again fight over some, some, some springs, some local farmers springs. Uh, when the Federal Army gets there first, um, they fall apart. That army falls apart and the regulars actually do worse than the volunteers, they tear down the spring house, they're, they're drinking mud. Um, they completely lose their composure because they've been marching all day without water. We forget about that. It's because, you know, we've got our, our bottled water, but um, they're marching with very little. And increasingly over time to save space, they're not even marching with canteens. They're just carrying cups and they're going to drink whenever they find something. What that did to them medically, during and after the war, especially after the war, I think is a real question we haven't explored yet. Um, those high carb diets and then bad water, 
uh, not enough water? I think it's 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 one of those great questions we still need to explore. I do it a little bit, but we need to look into that much more. That's that is really powerful. Um, another question, just speaking on the um, history of emancipation and environment, one person um, also asked specifically about the environmental experiences of people who, um, you know, enslaved people who began to follow the Union Army who were seeking freedom, but had less protection and less shelter than the soldiers themselves would have. So do we know, what do we know about their experiences or the kinds of innovations, the kinds of ways that they tried to contend with the environmental conditions that they were facing? Well, we certainly know they follow when they can. And the treatment tends to depend on the soldiers they're with, and the commanders of those soldiers. In the Perryville campaign, uh, there are several regiments full of abolitionists who will protect uh, people escaping slavery to the degree that they will help them uh, with food and water and shelter and even drive away slave owners. In other cases, that doesn't happen at all. I mentioned Amy Taylor's work on Camp Nelson in Kentucky, uh, where during a very cold snap of weather, uh, the Union commander Speed Fry uh, allowed African-American soldiers to remain, but drove out their wives and children, uh, many of whom got really sick and some died thereafter. So it, it's, it's a local issue um, and it really depends on the troops and especially on the commanders and sometimes the troops and the commanders clash. Uh, again, at, at, you know, marching to Perryville, there's a Wisconsin regiment that takes in escaping enslaved people. And they end up in a hollow square with their brigade commander threatening to shoot them all. They've also attacked a couple of slave owners. They also go out and burn down the slave owner's house that night. But that's not typical. There's, there's such a, a range of these experiences. So what we have are people fleeing slavery who are going through these same environmental conditions. And what happens to them depends on a lot of a lot of issues, including the soldiers, the commanders. Gender becomes a role. We see uh, Sherman in Georgia putting men to work. He's happy to take men along with him uh, to do labor, but not women. It gets really, really complicated, but it's a great question. We've got some other great questions coming in in the Q&A. We'll keep our eyes uh, there. And then we'll, we'll, when we get to the end of the hour, we'll wrap up with a kind of step back, a couple step back overview questions. Um, but I think uh, the interest in the topic is really reflecting the questions and some of the details they're asking about. Um, one of which is about sources and medical records. Did you find that this is about, did you find that medical records gave you insight into the experiences that soldiers were having as they, with the weather as they were either wounded or, or died? I didn't use medical records actually as much in this study as I have in previous ones. Uh, but certainly um, quite a few of my sources ended up in hospital. So I got a sense of how men were trying to recover from problems in the field. Um, I was struck by the number of men I encountered who uh, were dealing with frostbite, dealing with heat exhaustion, dealing with the sorts of ailments that I had never really expected to find when I went into this study. Uh, and other soldiers, just discussing, you know, Lieutenant so-and-so or the boys in Company B who were said to be just played out. They can't fight anymore. They can't march anymore. They've been through this terrible winter and they have become useless as soldiers. Lieutenant so-and-so resigns because he can't stay with his men anymore. You have recruits coming down from the north who arrive in Nashville, it's very cold in Nashville in the winter of 64, 65, and they never get to their units because they get sick and they stay in the hospital the rest of the war. Um, and that was more, more of a spotty exploration. I did not uh, deliberately go through a lot of medical records, uh, but I certainly did pick up those insights along the way. Uh, another question is about the intersection of weather and technology, which is how did the weather impact communications 
um, human communications, mail delivery, telegraph lines? Did you find that the, the weather was a significant force in determining whether news made it through, whether you know, communications within uh, the army made it, made it to where they were supposed to go? During bad weather conditions, heavy snow, lots of rain and mud, wagons stop moving, bridges collapse, rivers flood. There's no mail. There's nothing going back and forth in terms of, of paper communication. Telegraph lines can come down in bad weather. Uh, it absolutely disrupts communication. I think to a surprising degree, I think we expected that. But, you know, for example, the Confederates have a very poor mail service anyway. So a lot of a lot of mail in the southern states is being delivered by Uncle John, who decided to come up to camp and visit everybody. That system, that that ersatz system, gets disrupted as well. So soldiers know when the Potomac freezes over, they're not going to be getting mail and packages for a while. They're also riding home before the Potomac freezes over, desperately hoping to get that new buffalo skin rug um, coat. Um, and in terms of military communications, uh, yeah, it delays couriers, couriers get lost, couriers get lost in the fog, they get lost in the rain, messages never get delivered. That seems to be a constant throughout the world. Question uh, that came in uh, starts us pulling back in a way that you reflect on directly in your uh, in your writing. So it's posed to ask whether you do, and I think I'm going to shift it, knowing that you do, to to how you make this case. Um, but the question lays out uh, that in the traditional narrative. Um, weather would be mentioned as a hardship soldiers contended with and endured. Um, and the question is posed is, um, are you making an argument about the weather being something that we should factor in as a determinative factor in the outcomes of battles, command performance, the war? Um, and I think I would uh, add to it, and, and what would be some of the examples or the, play, or the arguments that you think uh, really show this really powerfully? Well, I don't believe in monocausality. I don't think whether shaped the war all by itself, but I think it's a factor that we need to bring forward. I mean, you're right, Greg, it's been on the back of the stage. It's been scenery. Oh, and by the way, it rained a lot that day. What I try to do in this book is, is bring the weather forward and make it, if not the lead actor, at least a significant supporting actor. And once, once you do that, well, I'll put it this way. Once I started doing that, I started looking at battles and campaigns in different ways. And I started looking at the history of the Civil War in different ways. I went to school at a time when we were having this huge debate over whether the Confederacy lost because it fell apart from within or whether it was defeated from without by more powerful Union armies. And we had that debate without knowing about these incredible food shortages that hit the Confederacy in 1862, and again in 1863, and Virginia and Missouri and the North in 1864. I had no idea that there had been these, these droughts. I had no idea that there had been these I don't want to say food shortages. I think it was worse. I tend to agree with Joan Waugh, uh, not Joan Waugh, uh, Joan Cashin, when she argues that there really was hunger and starvation in the Confederacy toward the end of the war. That has a dramatic effect on everything. It affects the military, it affects home front life, it affects politics. Um, and I don't think we can fully understand Confederate legislation, the Confederacy's decision to prioritize feeding soldiers over civilians. I don't think we can understand that unless we go back to the weather and its effect on agriculture. And it's really, really important. Um, so I think, I think we do need to think of it as a major player, perhaps not the major player. I'm not gonna go that far, but I think it's a factor that we have ignored for whatever reason up to now, and I'll add, I'm not sure why we've ignored it because when you start reading soldiers' letters and 
diaries and the regimental histories that came out 20 and 25 years later, they talk about weather all the time. I mean, the, the biggest problem I had in researching this book was finding a way to limit my research so I could actually get it done in one lifetime. They knew it was important, uh, but somehow we decided to focus on other issues. Um, and thank you. And you're mentioning the food shortages, particularly in the Confederacy, which were linked to odd weather patterns, um, makes me want to sort of circle back to an argument that you make that um, you sort of say, from the beginning of the war, the Confederates thought the weather would be on their side. And we, there's reason to think that. I mean, most mm -hmm. of the war was fought in the South. Confederates more, were more familiar with things like red clay, mud, mm -hmm. and the weather patterns characteristic of the South. And yet you argue by the end of the war, in your judgment, the weather was kind of on the Union side. Yeah. And so exactly. how does that happen? I mean, what it, what is the um, argument that you make? So you've mentioned, you know, for example, food shortages in the Confederacy, but what are the pieces that you put together to kind of come around to the side that all things being equal, the the, the weird weather of the Civil War period actually um, helped the Union more than it helped the Confederacy? Well, you're right. The Confederates thought they had an edge because those Northerners coming down here, they don't understand our diseases. They're all going to get sick. They don't know how to deal with our mud. We know how to deal with our mud. Um, but what they didn't factor in was a technological base in the North that would allow the federal soldiers to deal better with those conditions, ponchos, boots, uniforms, wagons, all of it. And the technology gave the North an added edge. You throw in the topography, the geography of the South, um, flooding on the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers early in 1862. Who does that help? It helps U.S. Grant. It helps him take Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. Uh, there, are, there are so many moments like that where just on the ground, weather seems to help federal generals. I was struck when I was writing about Sterling Price's retreat from Missouri into Arkansas. It seemed like every time the weather turned really rainy or snowy or really, really cold. Uh, Curtis's army was in a town with shelter and the Confederates were out on the road. And that just happens again and again. Once you add into the fact that you're dealing with a Confederate army that has um, a smaller manpower base, smaller base on horses and mules ultimately, um, fewer medicines, less equipment and most of the time when they're out on the march somehow they're all complaining we're always out in the open and the yankees are undercover so i mean some of that is some of that is happenstance some of it can be planned i guess the other thing i would say about that too is i think i think weather was on the union side if you will more often than it was on the confederate side but i sometimes think it was one of those non aligned powers that they had its own agenda, as non-aligned powers often do. Um, I'm thinking about Glenn Brasher's argument that McClellan's failure on the peninsula made the Emancipation Proclamation and the Second Confiscation Act possible. I mean, if McClellan takes Richmond in the summer of 1862, maybe that doesn't end the war, but it hastens the end of the war. And maybe the United States re reunites as a nation without, well, still with, or nation still with slavery. I think weather was part of that equation. And there are other moments where weather just seems to be dragging it out. Every time the Union Army seems to be close to victory, Lee gets across the Potomac and escapes. So I think maybe the ultimate impact of, of climate and weather in the war is just dragging it out those four years while it became a war of emancipation. And I think that's incredibly important. I mean, we've got a couple you know, one time for one or two more uh, small questions and we'll end up with a, with a big question or two. Um, one of the more focused questions that, uh, that, that raises some interesting uh, ideas 
is how much you think that the experience of soldiers who were farmers, which is a large number of them, shaped their own ways of seeing uh, the impact of weather and also as they experienced weather and the war um, about the ways they worried about the weather's impact uh, back home, you know, being concerned about a drought, not only making it say challenging for them to find drinking water, but also potentially spreading to their, their farms and their homesteads. You know, most of them are not, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. Most of them are farmers. Uh, that doesn't seem to help them at all in terms of disease. Um, but they see the world so often as farmers. They look at conditions and say, there's drought coming. They say, it's going to be a rough winter. We had better start building our cabins even before our, our officers allow us to do so. When, when federal armies start moving into the South, one of the things they're going to bring with it is a, a terrible epidemic of glanders, which starts killing off horses and mules, I mean, to the degree that it takes years and years for the Southern horse and mule population to recover. They see that happening. And so, yeah, they worry a lot about what's happening back home. Um, and there are moments when those worries become overwhelming. I mean, we, we know eventually a lot of them are going to desert and go home because they're, they're getting letters about, you know, you know, we're starving and the like. Well, a lot of that starving has to do with weather conditions. Rainy, rainy planting seasons, which generally kept uh, crops from being planted for a month or so. So everything's getting planted late and then the droughts come along in the summer. Letters are going back and forth constantly relating these conditions. And I think it makes Confederate soldiers in particular quite anxious. It sometimes makes Union soldiers anxious as well. There is, there are areas of drought in the Union throughout the war, and certainly there's there's a bad period in 1864. I mean, to the point that it became a political issue in the 1864 presidential campaign. Um, Democrats charging that Lincoln's taken away all of our boys, and now we have a drought. We're all going to starve this winter. And Republicans, including Horace Greeley and eventually the Department of Agriculture desperately printing statistics saying, no, 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 we're going to be fine. We, we don't have to worry about starving to death this winter. They know what's going on uh, on the home front. They're very concerned. And I think it increases that, that pull factor, that pull factor that's always threatening to pull them back home. Uh Quick question, straightforward question. Somebody's writing, Ken, great job with the book. In the Thank course you. of your research, <laughs> did you unearth accounts of officers using thermometers on the field of battle? On the field of battle, no. I was, I was struck and dismayed by how few thermometers there seemed to be in existence, period. I, I had hoped to find more hard data, especially in the West and in the Trans-Mississippi where we don't have many other official observers. Um, there is there is a weather station, a little weather station that the Union Army sets up along with its telegraph uh, right before the Battle of the Wilderness. So they're doing it there. But other than that, it's just sort of the occasional, oh, it was 95 degrees today. And I find myself wondering how they knew that. So I think a few people did have thermometers, perhaps, but certainly I don't think anybody went out, you know, on the field of Antietam and said, well, it's 83 degrees. Um, I mean, one other thing I will mention in connection with that, there's, there's a, I can't remember the exact date, but it's in the winter of 1864-65. It becomes really cold in Richmond. And the celebrated war clerk, J.B. Jones, decides he wants to know what the temperature is and spends the day wandering around Richmond trying to find a thermometer. The, uh, so we'll do one last, uh, last question and, and then wrap up. And uh, I'm kind of cheating. I'm going to shoehorn two questions in together, but you can, uh, you can come to the fork of the road and take it. Um, a number of people in the, in the question and answer um, submitted uh, that they noted 
um, the relevance of your work for our understanding of the development of military planning, that this kind of idea of wars being fought, as you said, outdoor, the army is an outdoor sport, um, you know, now um, more directly influences uh, contemporary doctrine and planning. Um, and so, uh, and some other questions that ask you about how that process came to be. How do you, how does the Civil War factor in the question of how armies came to realize that they had to take climate and weather uh, more seriously in their planning? And uh, the flip side of that are almost in some ways the inverse, um, you know, uh, something I wondered in, in reading your book, is the degree to which when we see um, Civil War era generals talking about, you know, uh, the outcome of a battle being partly dependent on planning and partly fate, how much is weather the fate? Uh, you know, not the monocausal fate, but how much do you think that weather explains some of the chance that arises? Uh, as plans go astray? I think weather often is fate. William Rosecrans had no idea when he launched the Tullahoma, Tullahoma campaign that he was going to be marching his men into what some people call a thousand year weather event. This is an era where no one is forecasting weather except in very crude traditional ways like the newspaper in Portland, Maine, who predicted a really bad winter in 1863, 1864, because muskrats had be, been seen double walling their shelters. They couldn't predict the weather other than just the, the immediate basics of it's getting dark, the sky is red. Uh, we know what generally happens this time of year and we should plan accordingly. So there are some generals who are almost willing to give in to that. It's winter, we should stop, wait for spring. There are other commanders and both Grant and Lincoln come to mind immediately who adopt an attitude of, well, we just have to power through this. We have to find ways to conquer the weather while we are conquering the Confederacy. But even in that case, weather doesn't really fit much into strategic planning other than maybe we should get across the river before the rains set in. Or we remember that it was really dry in August here last summer. So the military eventually will move toward trying to make those predictions, trying to understand um, what to expect in terms of weather, but it's still very rudimentary during the 19th century, because it's really not until the early 20th century that we even understand the sorts of things we see on the TV news, like cold fronts and warm fronts. That's 20th century knowledge. And once that knowledge is available, um, military commanders are, are more able to plan ahead. You know, we always think about George Patton during the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, they're able to do that in the 20th century and obviously in the 21st century. They really can't do that in the 19th century because they, they really don't understand how weather works. Uh, the whole point of the Smithsonian system I mentioned was to try to prove that there were regional and national weather patterns. No one really knew those existed. So let's take a lot of different readings in a lot of different places. And one of these days we'll put them together and maybe we can watch these storms move from west to east, which was actually kind of fun when I could do that working on this book, they don't, they don't have that. And so it's either fate, man, hope it doesn't rain tonight, or that's sort of what Mark, Mark Feige calls Whiggish mindset of, we don't care if it rains tonight, we're going to advance anyway, despite the cost in men and horses. Well, thank you so much. This has been uh, so interesting and, and you give us so many different things to, to think about and ideas to apply to a variety of other situations, uh, civil war and otherwise. Um, so I really appreciate you being here with us today and also thanks to the many people who came and for your wonderful questions. Um, I'm going to wrap it up now uh, with a couple of brief thanks. First of all, to Matt Isham and Cecily Zander, Cecily Zander, who've been working behind the scenes to uh, make this happen uh, in every way. We could not do it without them. 
And I want to just remind you our next uh, our next events, Wednesday, April 14th, 4 p.m. Eastern, Elena Roberts talking about her book, I've Been Here All the While, Black Freedom on Native Land. And Wednesday, May 12th at 4 p.m. Eastern, Kevin Waite talking about his new book, West of Slavery, The Southern Dream of a Transcontinental Empire. And also to point you to our YouTube channel, you can find it by just Googling JCWE YouTube, which is what I usually do. You can also get there from our journal's webpage, uh, our journal has a web page and it has a box that will point you to the YouTube channel. And that's where we're keeping all of these online chats that we're doing. And in short order, thanks to the editing of Matt Isham, this one too will be up there. So we hope you'll check back there and visit us uh, and come to our next few events. And that's all. So Ken, no, thank you so much for being with us. And thanks for this really terrific book. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. This was awesome. And thanks all who tuned up.